I started by saying, if you didn't hear it, that Audley End is fortunate to have not one, but two diaries written by working gardeners on the estate. The first diary we discovered um, was fortunate that at the time when the kitchen garden, the large kitchen garden was being um, renovated around the year um, 1990s to 2000, uh, somebody found a handwritten diary, the black uh, bound volume you can see there, in the Covent Garden um, Novelties Market, and very kindly eventually sent it in to Audley End. And it was invaluable source material for the um, renovations that were, were being undertaken. Um, William Cresswell was an undergardener. He was on the estate for not quite two years. Um, he was a local lad from the Cambridge area and he moved on to other things. His diary um, included quite a lot of social information as well as the work he was doing in the garden. Um, he seemed to spend quite a lot of time going off to the local church to listen to choirs. Uh, he was involved in um, local shows and that kind of thing. So it was a social diary as well as just the work he was doing. The diary I'm talking about this evening was um, a different kind of diary. It was simply the work he was doing in the garden. It's about 80 years before the Victorian one. So a really sort of fascinating look into the garden at the very end of the 18th century. It seems to be several separate documents, probably made up into a book later. That's a little bit mysterious, probably needs somebody who knows about um, you know, heritage books to look into that a bit further. Um, it was purchased in 2019 from an auction site by Friends of Audley End. So once again, it was complete chance that it came into our hands. As you can see on the cover there, it's um, got the name of W.A. Pethybridge, Amesbury. And that's clearly not Thomas Chalice. So we'll have to see if we can discover who W.A. Pethybridge was um, as we go on. So there's a, a page, the first page of Thomas Chalice, his book. Um, it's dated 1792, but the diary that we have is, is from the, the slightly later period. And the first page, just to show you the writing and so on there. Um, ah, this is going to be larger than I expected it to be. But anyway, it says he was born in October uh, 1777 in Kirtling. That's near Newmarket, which is just over the Essex border um, in Cambridgeshire. And he was christened that year. And he then says in 1792, he went to live at Cheveley Park. So he left school around about 15 and went to work um, at a, a large estate, which again is near Newmarket, which at that time was being um, converted really from woodland to a, a more parkland sort of setting. So when he came to Audley End, he had, he had that experience already. Um, so I ought to tell you a little bit about what Audley End was like when he arrived. Now, if you don't know Audley End, it's a, a, a Jacobean prodigy house in the very north part of Essex, northwest Essex, only a few miles from the Cambridge border. It started life as a, a, an abbey in the 12th century. And in fact, those of you who can see the... Um, the, the painting that I've got up at the moment. All these paintings are from Audley End collection, English Heritage collection. You can just see in the middle what looks like a, a large square open space, and that is actually the footprint of the monk's cloister. The um, so-called prodigy house was eventually built on that. This picture dates from the 1670s. The house was actually built 1604 to 1614. And you can see um, the sort of estate around it at the time, all the trees on the on the, the shallow hills, the alleys moving down to the house. Um, and on the right, uh, pointing this out because we'll be talking about it later, is the Mount Garden. Um, this was a garden with a raised walkway, tree lined all the way round, coming out onto a rather large bastion of which there's only a mound left. And that was the side of the house that when King James visited, 
the owner, um, his quarters would have been on, on the Mount Garden side of the house. So a very grand place that King James described as hmm, a palace rather too great for a king, but maybe okay for a Lord Treasurer. And the Lord Treasurer was fairly soon in the tower um, for embezzlement with um, debts and fines so enormous that the house went into a decline for a hundred years. And here you see another image from around 1710. I think if you've got good eyesight, you can see that the two side wings have, have been demolished. And the Mount Garden is still there, but um, not looking as perhaps as uh, well kept and, and shaped as it was before. The, the trees on the hills are, are much more gappy, perhaps sold off for timber to pay debts, who knows and the, the straight avenue across the straight canalised river still there at that point. But very soon after this picture, middle of the century, even that large wing at the front of the house was swept away and um, more happened. So the new owner, Sir John Griffin Griffin, moved in in the 17, um, inherited and moved in the 1760s and soon got to work with Capability Brown to transform the place into the typical parkland setting that Thomas had probably already knew a bit about at um, Cheveley Park. Thomas is working there at the very end of the century. So the garden in this post Brownian form had been there for about 30 years. You can see at the side of the house on the left hand picture, if your eyesight's very good, um, there is a little flower garden there. And that's quite an unusual feature. Um, it was called Lady Griffin's Garden, and the um, the information that we have about the uh, contract with Brown says he was putting a, a flower garden in um, for Lady Griffin. And the the right hand picture is is the looking in the opposite direction at the Mount Garden, I and mean, you can see that the only gravel path is the one al alongside the house, and the rest has all gone over to uh, to grass. The little tree there is a cypress and it's now a very magnificent specimen. Um, whether it originally had flowers around, it probably did if, if Brown was putting in the flower garden, but it certainly hasn't got flowers around it now. The family was quite friendly with the family at um, Newnan Courtney and uh, maybe there was an interaction with the, with the flower um, situation from there. So that's what, that's what Thomas um, came to. What um, wasn't in any of the old um, garden before Brown was what's called the Elysian Garden. Um, and those are the pictures there, the Elysian Garden. This was made from what had been the watermill area of the monastery and the very early house. Uh, I don't know why Sir John decided to make a pleasure grounds of it, but he did. And you can see the cascade there in that picture on the right, which presumably was fashioned from the mill race area. Again, the river's been serpentined. Um, there's, a, there's a very nice um, Robert Adam Palladian um, bridge called the Tea Bridge. We do have two swans, they oblige occasionally, and the, the little Turkish tent there. Um, for those of you garden historians who like to know these things, if you look very closely, you can see that the tree on the riverbank is um, not in the same place in both the contemporary pictures. So did he go home and just put it in afterwards? There is a tree on the riverbank now. And also, those of you who can see the turrets of the house, um, they're over to the left of the picture, but the house is actually over to the right. Um, so caution with images when you're trying to reconstruct anything. The, the Turkish tent, we've got nice letters talking about the ladies doing their work and the gentlemen fishing and um, one evening they even had a French horn concert down by the side of this Elysian paradise garden. So this was all in place when um, Thomas Chalice arrived. These, these are the, um, these next images are those of the kitchen garden, which he would have been most familiar with. Um, in the 1750s, the kitchen garden was moved from the cellar garden next to the house over to its current position, which is, um, not far, but not close to the house, but importantly, it's right behind the stables. So just perfect for all the manure coming in to, to do its good work. And then when Sir John came, he enlarged the kitchen garden. And so it's this enlarged garden that William Chalice would have been working in. 
Um, he added the glass house wall, which is marked with the blue arrow. There's the green house, which I'll show you an image of in a minute, not a, a glass house as we know it at all. Um, and the Elysian Garden that we've just been talk talking about from the 1780s. So it's been there when, when um, Thomas comes, about 15, 18 years. And there is a, a famous hot wall with flues, which was not yet built in Thomas's time. The extension, number 10 on the plan there, um, w was added by Sir John. And I don't know if you can see, but the garden isn't rectangular. It's, um, it's narrower at one end than the other. And this enabled the, um, the warm air to flow down the garden and uh, crops at the narrower end matured a couple of weeks earlier than at the, at the um, more, more spacious end. Um, all sorts of clever um, techniques like that because what else did you have? So this is a picture of the uh, drawing of the, the greenhouse as it's described there. Um, more like a, uh, an orangery really, but you can see in the front of the picture the two uh, beds, which are, they look like boxes, but they're flat on the ground. And they were the plunge beds for, for different things. Um, and that was replaced in the early 1800s after Thomas had left with a range of glass houses which are still there. However, in Thomas's diary at the back, there are these couple of sketches of um, presumably greenhouses, no commentary on them, which are quite unlike the, 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 the greenhouse that existed in Audley End when he was when he was working there. And I think you can see um, the plants plunged into the hotbeds and staging with plants on and little um, shelves on the wall for that would have been for the strawberries. Um, and it's definitely later than Thomas because there's a, there's a thing on a little thing that you won't be able to read that says this is the door going through to the fire um, and the current glass house has chimneys. So that's just interesting. Um, right, so I just put this picture in, you'll all be familiar with it, the forcing garden from Humphrey Repton's book. Um, the, the, the kitchen garden area was not just for growing things, it was also for display. And um, although Thomas Chalice's garden didn't have glass houses like this, it would still very much have been somewhere that <coughs> Sir John would have brought his guests to see the pineapples growing or whatever. Um, but note on it, tools. There's a, a besom there. And there's um, a wooden wheelbarrow. And I haven't got lots of pictures of tools, but I was at Dudmaston National Trust recently, and there's a wonderful door there, um, decorated by the owner's sister, showing a whole range of garden tools as a decorative motif with ivy um, surrounding them. And all the tools are extremely recognisable. Um, in fact, the wheelbarrow on, on the door has iron structure and a wheel it's not a totally wooden wheelbarrow but other than that there's a watering can there's a roller rakes hose all the things that you would expect and a nice rhubarb pot looking just like the ones that cost huge amounts of money if you want to buy one now um this this nice image uh, michael ann found for the flyer so i thought I'd, I'd like to use it again and there's a wheelbarrow um it's a french image so i don't know if the garden is in rather more chic costume than, than he would have had at Audley End, but it gives you a nice feel for, for the period. Um, a little bit about the pay. I, the Audley End record suggests that in the 1760s to 70s, the gardener was earning £16 per annum. And then in 1772, a new man came and up to 1791, he got £25 an annum. So it's not clear whether that was just raising the pay or whether there were extra duties. And I'm afraid I have no idea, because it, there's no statement about it, whether this was the head gardener or any other gardener. But it sort of gives you a feel for the kind of amount of, um, amount of money that was changing hands for people working in the garden. So it's two diaries in one, that book that I showed you. The first part is work done at Audley End in, in the period shown. And that's records of work only on cucumbers and melons. The second diary is work done at Audley End in the kitchen guarding, and that's general records of vegetable and flower garden work. And 
I, one of the reasons I think it's been sewn together as a book is that they're both complete. So unless he left loads of pages and it instantly started his second, you know, it must have been put together afterwards. Um, as well as that, other sections of the manuscript include recipes. There's one for black ink and the list of um, ingredients is huge. And there's one for gooseberry vinegar. Um, 130 pages cover copied out by hand a treatise on the vine, a very well known one. Um, how else did you get your information other than copying it out for yourself? Um, there's another page entitled Observations on Planting Potatoes in a Field. There's a recipe for dealing with red spider on peaches and two pages on keeping peach and nectarine trees in houses um, while they're being forced. And then there's a method given me by an old gardener for forcing peach and nectarines. So th this is what gardeners are encouraged to do, read and copy and, and um, you know, make it their own. There are eight pages on the management of the pineapple plants at William Gosling's Esquire, 1803. And then um, work done at Jenkins and Griffiths Nursery in 1809. And this is where he worked in 1809. And that includes information on orange and lemon trees. And then there are six pages of other recipes, including several wine recipes and English champagne, which, if I remember correctly, is made from gooseberries. So we should have a go. So that's that's what the diary looks like. He, he puts the date and every day he says what he's doing over and over again. So the writing wasn't hard. I transcribed this during the second the winter lockdown. The writing wasn't too hard um, to follow, but the um, some of the um, some of the spelling made working out what he was talking about difficult. Um, <laughs> the first sentence, I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be harder than I expected. Made the hobber for the cucumbers, and I thought, well, I'll leave that. I'll come back to that. Made the hobber for the cucumbers. Occurred to me, you know, not too far in that he's talking about hotbeds. He does call them hotbeds later, but quite often he just calls them hobbers. Um, interesting to see that he was sowing um, cucumber seed on the 28th of December, and he was cutting the first cucumber on the 30th of March. And this was clearly achieved only with um, material to create hotbeds. Um, loined the hobber. I assume that means he's putting the material into the hobber. Um, made the first what 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 looks like rig bed, but I I assume is ridge bed. So he's he's planting out the um, cucumbers in in ridges. Laid a hill of dry earth in each light preserved for that purpose. Made a second ridge bed. Pages and pages do say things like made the first ridge bed, made the second ridge. Bed. You know, he's not communicative about anything other than the work he's doing. There's almost no um, social information in the book. Um, after a bit, I sort of got the idea that if I put on a, a rural accent, I'd be able to, to work it out. So when I got to the word kiver, kiver, cover, <laughs> um, that got me going, great house. So on the 23rd of March, he cut a brace of pineapples out of the rose house. It doesn't say any more much about pineapples, but he cut a brace of them on the 23rd of March. And on the 22nd of March, he gathered the first dish of French beans that was raised in the grape house. So, um, you know, they, were, they just had to produce everything for succession. There was no excuses, but there was also nothing much to help them other than uh, 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 manure, bark, tannin, um, glass lights they're putting on things, straw matting to keep the heat in, heaping up earth and manure around the outside of the beds. Um, and that was what they spent a lot of time doing. He cut the first melon in June. Um, as a, as, a, as, a, as a, a linguist, before I became a garden historian, this is some fascinating stuff for me. Because if you can see there, at March the 31st, 30th, he cut the first cucumber. 31st, he cut another cucumber. Another is the word with a capital letter. Um, and then in May, he ridged out the first cucumbers in the netril ground. Now, this is my biggest um, 
problem. What on earth is the natural ground? I've got the melon ground. What's the natural ground? I looked it up. I Googled it. I guessed things. I just couldn't get it. What's a natural? Anyway, my husband was on one of the um, lockdown walks with a, a, an ex-colleague of his uh, who was brought up locally around Saffron Morden, and he was telling them about my problem with the natural, what's the natural ground? He said, oh, that's easy. It's the natural ground, the natural ground. <laughs> I'd, I, would never have, I would never have got that, and I can't quite do the accent. So in September, moving to the other end of the year, he was doing a lot of the um, autumn jobs, hoeing, cleaning the garden, cleaning the garden, hoeing things, planting winter crops, pulling up the onions for drying, odd jobs such as cleaning seeds and garlic, cleaning the bulbs, trenching up the ground, um, laying the broccoli plants down to preserve them for the winter, potting up violets to force for the spring, and making a mushroom bed. <laughs> I like that one. I can't do this. So um, that was how he was busy. Another very major task was the nailing. They're nailing and unnailing the, um, the, the grape uh, vines, the plum trees, the pear trees, the cherry trees. Um, spend days and days doing that, not only in the gardens that we looked at, but also in the gardens of some of the higher um, estate officials, the steward and so on and um, on and on and on with, with that. I, I'm not quite sure about on nailing. I'm not sure if nailing is the same as on nailing and that sometimes he says one and not the other. But it could be unnailing that, you know, they're loosening them and rearranging them. I'm just not sure about that. So a very large range of fruit and vegetables was grown and succession was extremely important. So he'll say things like, sow some more peas to succeed other crops. And um, again, my, my linguistic interests amused me. I, I, unfortunately, some of you in the room can't see this, but people at home can have a good guess at, at um, guessing what hearty chokes are. <laughs> um, and then asparo gus, um, scotsnary. Mershrooms, that's obvious. Small salading, that took a bit of working out. And basil, which is actually basil, basil, basil. Um, Skirrets, well, that's a kind of root, um, root vegetable. Collards, that's um, uh, greens. And in fact, Americans, I think, still call them collards. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, cardoons, celesify, which I think is salsify. <laughs> Churries, damazons, plumb, grape, walnuts. And then we get on to the flowers, mergonets. Any offers? Minionettes. Arecolas. Balsam, violet, sweet briar, oribus furnace. That's lathyrus furnace, it's a sweet pea. And chinaster, which is china aster. So that was that was just a bit of fun to uh, to show you the kind of issues with with uh, transcribing. That's just a slide that shows you the whole range of things that were grown. And if you're interested, I can let you have that in in a form that you can actually read. Um, but there was something going on all year round. Tomatoes aren't mentioned. I don't remember ever seeing tomatoes. Interesting. So Thomas was responsible for flowers as well as ornamentals. Um, he, he says he was potting things up quite often, potting up tender annuals on the hotbeds. I think they often used to pot them up into wooden boxes and put the boxes on the hotbeds and then move them to a different warmer bed when that one had cooled down until they got to the, the right size. And he talks about making a three light hotbed to plunge the pots in and I think that is rather similar to what we saw in the in the sketch earlier on, plunging the, the pots into the um, hot material to, to give them uh, a, a good leg up. Um, in December, they were bringing in hyacinths and violets and lily of the valley into the rose house to force. 
And they picked the first rose in mid-February, so they're really going great guns with their forcing. Um, he set different kinds of greenhouse plants under hand glasses, so he's working in and out. In April, he took the plants that had stood all the winter out to the Elysian Garden, and that's the garden we saw that had been created from the watermill area, which at that time was very much a flower garden, planted out in the tradition of the, the lower plants, the shrubs and the trees. But um, before too long, just after Thomas's time, that was discovered to be a bit of a frost pocket and it stopped being a flower garden and they made a parterre at the back of the house. In July, he was piping of some of the double blossomed feather few, I think that must be fever few, and he was laying carnations. So he, he, he's got a lot of skills, you know, around the whole area of, um, of horticulture. So he had other chores as well. In March and December, he helped to fill the ice house with ice. Now, the ice house at the end is up on the hill, um, well up from the river. I don't know why, perhaps it's a bit colder up there. Um, March, that, that year, wasn't very cold. That winter up to March was not a very cold winter, but it must have been cold enough to produce ice on the relatively slow flowing uh, River Cam um, for them to cut it. But December 76, 1796 was very cold winter. I think the Thames also froze, so they had plenty of ice to put in the ice house that winter. In April, he talks about mowing the Mount Garden. That's the one we saw on the right hand side of the house and also the Elysian Garden. And he's talking, of course, about mowing with um, scythe. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of the word. Yeah. In fact, at an earlier period, uh, not too much earlier, there reports that it took 12 men um, to mow the seven, seven miles of grass in order to end something like that, a, a huge uh, mowing operation. And he was also cutting bo box edging. And I guess that's box edging in the in the vegetable garden. I'm not sure about where the box edging was. He doesn't he doesn't say. Then another job was to collect seeds to grow in the uh, tree nursery. Um, seeds of hornbeam, laurel, and then the rose seeds. He cleaned them, and then they grew them up for their own hedging and um, and use. Everything was done on site. Another one which I rather was rather interesting, was picking bladdered leaves and them that are full of insects off the wall trees. They're actually literally picking all the bugs off the, the wall trees. You can only do that if you've got a lot of gardeners. Um, then this is interesting, put the pommy of a parcel of old rotten pears in the ground to grow stocks. I think the pommy is the pulp, so the old rotten pears had been left to pulp and then he must have dug it in. Um, and he was growing stocks on that area. Here's another one. Began to stick the wall trees with, well, I, I can't do the, uh, the way he actually wrote it, but spruce fir boughs to keep the bloom of the trees from blighting in the wind. So this is where the, um, the wall trees have got the blossom and they're putting fir boughs on to stop the wind damaging the, um, the blossom to creating the fruit. And then he sowed a crop of drumhem cabbage seed to plant in fields for the cows. So it wasn't just the humans they were feeding in, um, in, the, in the estate, they were, they were feeding the animals as well. So as I said before, the interaction between the house and the garden is, is, is rarely mentioned. Um, the only things I actually found were that he was collecting berries for the housekeeper to make jam. <coughs> Excuse me. He, he was sowing onions to make buttons for tripe, so tripe and onions. Oh, I remember eating that in my youth. And gathering radish pods and gherkins for pickling. So, you know, he was, he was doing that and taking it off to the kitchen area to be dealt with. And then he says he loaded the wagon to go to London. And five days later, our family went to London. So this is the migration of the family to uh, New Burlington Street house. And um, he, he'd loaded up the wagon and then the family followed. Um, there's no mention, excuse me. <coughs> there's no mention of um, sending food up to London. Whereas in 
William Cresswell's diary, there's quite a bit of going to pick the strawberries and taking them toward the end station, trains by then, and um, sending them up to the family to, to have for their evening, evening meal. Thank you. <coughs> so John Griffin Griffin died on the 25th of May, 1797, but that's not mentioned in the diary at all, which I, I do find a bit extraordinary. I thought you would have at least noted that your employer had, had died, but maybe he was so distant from them, you know, that didn't, didn't figure. So I was quite interested to see what kind of time off they got, and he got every Sunday off, and that, that was it, really. He got Christmas Day off, but not if it fell on a Sunday. There was no extra day if Christmas Day fell on a Sunday. And there was a very occasional, what he called a wet day, W-H-E-T, a wet day. Not very many of those. It must have been very wet if they weren't doing anything. Once a year in March, <coughs> there was something called a fast, fast day. And I'm not entirely sure what that was, but certainly if you look at the welcome collection, there are quite a lot of sermons um, recorded that were given on these fast days. So that was, a, a, I assume, a day off. Good Friday was a work day. And on the 19th of December, 1797, was something called Thanksgiving Day, which apparently was a national celebration for the naval victories of that year. But it wasn't a day off because he was pruning the currant bushes that, that, that day. But he did mention that it was uh, Thanksgiving Day. And then, little sad note, on the 1st of September, he said, my dear sister Hannah was buried. And that is the only personal note at all in anything that's there. But even that day, he still had odd jobs, and it was a Saturday. <coughs> on the day his sister Sarah got married at St Mary's, he simply records gathering of apples. He doesn't mention she got married. We know that from other, other information. Uh, he had two sisters who um, married and died locally, died very young, not long after being married really. Um, and it, it could be that they'd been in service, either at Audley End, although we've no record so far of that, or at another of the houses in the area. And that could have been the reason why he, he moved across to Saffron Warden. But um, neither of the sisters we couldn't trace any children for the sisters. So they might have died in childbirth or from the, you know, one of the many plagues going around. Um, nothing else from, from local family. <coughs> Apologies for the cough. <coughs> his later career, he left Audi End in 1798 and he simply says in his diary, I left Audi End. It doesn't say why, but of course they all did this journeyman thing of, you know, a couple of years in one place, moving on to another place, picking up skills on the way. So for about four years, he worked in nurseries in the States around East Anglia. Um, and then he moved to London and moved to, uh, nurse, to work in nurseries in London. Um, then in 1804, he went to work in Billingbeer Park. Now, that was owned by Lord Braybrook, who was the new owner of Audley End. Billingbeer Park had been the home of the Countess of Portsmouth, who'd inherited Audley End and done it up for her nephew, Sir John Griffin Griffin. Um, it, it, it burnt down, I think, in the 1920s, and I believe it might be a golf course now, but um, that's where um, Thomas worked. He married Mary Jones at St George's, Hanover Square. Now that was a bit of a surprise to me really because that was quite a you know fashionable smart place to be married possibly through lord braybrook's connection i i don't know but interesting eh um and then in 1809 he moved to stand lynch park in wiltshire now that was later called trafalgar park and it was the um place that i he, lord nelson's older brother had been given i think by the nation really i mean nelson was dead obviously um, and his heirs. And he worked there till he died. He died in 1845, leaving two sons and four daughters. So we come back to William Petherbridge, Amesbury. Um, 
Amesbury. Well, that's where Standlich Park is. So that, that perhaps is a clue. And he left four daughters, we heard, didn't we? Um, so possibly this has come through a marriage connection. But so far, we haven't been able to um, trace it. It would be nice to. Uh, his son, there's, there's a section at the end of the diary where his son has sort of added family information, uh, names of the children, where they're buried. And this, and they're all buried in this place called Downton, which is just near Amesbury. <clears throat> so I did have a look at burial records in Amesbury, and I did find a William Pethybridge, a William Arthur Pethybridge, who is buried there. So we're guessing that's, you know, the, the provenance of the book, but who he is in relation to Thomas, we're, we're really not sure. We, we need to look into that a bit, a bit further. The book just came on an auction site. Um, it didn't come directly from the family or, or anything like that. <clears throat> so, Thomas Chalice, his book, 1792, a fascinating read. Um, not revealing very much about social mores at the times. He's simply in the garden seven, uh, six out of seven days a week, working hard, as far as we can see, and moving on to different um, nurseries and estates and gaining um, experience till he ends up at Trafalgar Park, where he um, worked until he died. He may have retired and then... We know he rented the garden for 10 years while the young Lord Nelson was a minor. So he may have retired and just and had it like that. So I'm not too sure about that. And his son William also um, became a gardener and records some of his career in the back of the book. So several people have had a hand in it. Um, it's, it's definitely not a sequential uh, record, but it's really fascinating. And uh, I really enjoyed transcribing it and delving into it. And I hope, I hope it's given you um, a little bit of an insight about a, a gardener working at the very, very end of the 18th century. <clears throat>